So the logic that I've that I've heard, and I think you you referenced this in the book as well, which is um, when Trump's policy, the Trump administration's policies around um, immigration, um, you know, it, of course it became a big deal when it was realized that ICE and uh, you know just the Border Patrol they were detaining families, but they were separating the children from their parents um, in these detention centers. Um, and then, of course, there were the many incidences of uh, them not being able to find the parents or or the children are basically like, OK, we don't know. <laughs> we didn't keep enough records or we didn't keep track well enough to know where the children should go after being detained for however many months um, in these really difficult and, and horrible circumstances. So I think some people would maybe say, well, that's just due to bureaucratic incompetence or some kind of, you know, like, oh, this is just how government, they just suck, right? They just don't work well. Um, so why wouldn't it work? You know, of course it wouldn't work well for this. So, but I'm like, I, I, from my understanding, the reason why this is so bad is it's ideological um, and it's it's just, they really want them to suffer as much as possible. Um, so could you comment on that? Is that, was that your sense of how the Trump administration in particular has approached this subject, approached this, this issue around immigration? Um, they're really seeking to make people suffer as much as possible. So when the family separation policy was first really instituted, and I think it's also important to note that family separation has taken place for a long time. It hasn't taken place on the scale that we saw being in 2018, but I reported on cases of family separation during the Obama administration, and it was just as absolutely awful and torturous then, but it just wasn't at the scale that we saw in, beginning in 2018 and continuing today. So it was not a bureaucratic bungle that caused this. It was still a bureaucratic mess that you know we saw. But it was very, very clearly intentional. And there's proof of that. And that proof is that when, so Jeff Sessions, the former attorney general, when he announced the, that they were going to, there was going to be a so-called zero tolerance policy on the border, that was where they were going to prosecute all crimes, including the misdemeanor of illegal entry when you cross the border without uh, having the, the, you know, legal, being legally granted to do so. Um, they were going to prosecute all of those crimes, even if it was committed by someone who was a parent and they had a small child with them. And then only because they were supposedly enforcing the law did they have to separate the parent from the child and, you know, take the parent to court and prosecute them. And meanwhile, since the child was a child, they were going to put them in the safe arms. So supposedly safe arms of Health and Human Services Office of Refugee and Resettlement. But the United States government, for the incredibly massive capacity that it has to, you know, draw misery on the body, bodies of migrants, you know, it's, it's it's incredibly overfunded, the agencies that are in charge with enforcing immigration law, they do not even come close to having the capacity to prosecute all illegal border crossing crimes. And they didn't in 2018 either. So in those first few months where we saw this zero tolerance policy, instituted, they had to select which people to prosecute. They, there was three times as many people who crossed the border without children as people who crossed the border with children in those first few months. And they selected, nonetheless, it, it, in, in those first months, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it was it, just in those first couple months, it was, I think it bordered on about 2,000 parents who were prosecuted. They could have prosecuted as many and three times more of parents who had no children. Yet they selected the ones with the children to prosecute. And they prosecuted them. They separated them from their children. And in some cases, they lost track of those children. The families, the parents were deported. The uh, children were sent to eventually like foster or be being, being adopted by other families. And they were never reunited. And some and, and in, in even the ones that were went through an unimaginably traumatizing experience. 
And yeah, again, not to fear spoilers. And I'm going to get back a little bit to the big picture of this policy in a second. But I think it's really important to understand or try to understand because I don't think I can. I don't think I've achieved it. Understanding what it was like for people who were separated. I've, I've reported on family separations a number of different times. Arnovis, as I mentioned, he brought his daughter with him on the last trip. They made it to the U.S.-Mexico border after another grueling, harrowing journey, uh, the details of which I'd be glad to relate, and I, I do in, in great detail in the book. A couple days after they were put in cages in South Texas, they were separated. They, he was lied to by the Border Patrol and said that um, his daughter, that she didn't fit on the bus, that they were going to take him to the next location um, on, and that she was going to be on the next bus. They knew that she wasn't going to be on the next bus. They, uh, uh, the next day when he was waiting for her to come, she hadn't come yet, he asked where she was. They said, we didn't know you had a daughter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what, what, what would that be like? To, to hear. I don't know. <laughs> we don't know she had a daughter and she's not with you and we have no idea where she is. He obviously insists that he had a daughter and that he was with her yesterday and they separated him her from him. They said, well, yeah, she were, she's, we're, we'll find her. We'll figure it out. Um, a couple days later, after waiting in you know this excruciating situation, they said, oh, uh, yeah, she's either in Florida or New York. So one of those two possibilities, Florida or New York, is where his daughter was. Meanwhile, he was still in now a detention center in um, in Carnes in, in southern Texas. And that was all he heard of her for the next 30 days. He asked repeatedly, insistently, desperately, where is my daughter? What happened to my daughter? When can I see my daughter? What can I do to get my daughter back? I will sign my deportation paper now, anything, anything at all to get my daughter back. And he didn't talk to her or know about her at all, except she's either in Florida or New York. Finally, when he was convinced that uh, signing for his deportation to get back to El Salvador, he would be reunited with his daughter. He was reunited, and through a sort of a complicated series of, of connections, he met up with a, uh, or he was connected to an attorney in, again, in Texas, Raices, and they found out that his daughter actually was neither in New York or in Florida, but was in Arizona. So, and, and eventually she was uh, sent back to El Salvador as well, and she was connected with him. I've, you know, talked to him and her at length, spent a lot of time with them, and I've never witnessed other, another instance in, in any reporting on, on trauma and, and like very serious, you know, just horrible experiences that people have gone through. I've never witnessed someone just clearly be unable to express the pain that they've suffered. When I, when, when he gets to that moment, to that, that idea that of what she went through and what it was like for her to go through it, he just breaks down. It's just like so clear. It's visibly breaks down. He talks about when she recalls to him, sometimes she'll say something like, Oh, Papa, remember when I was in prison in the United States? And to hear a six-year-old talk about being in prison, yeah. it's like, what did I do to her? And he so feels such just, just frothing, crazy guilt for what he did. And he was doing it, obviously, in what he thought was her best interest. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, another case I, I, I talked to, eventually they lost, this man lost his son. He um, was promised repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly to the Honduran man that he would be reunited. His son would be returned for, to him. He had already been, again, signed his deportation, hoping that it would reunite them more quickly. And he had a fa- he had a sister in the United States in New Jersey. His son was in Chicago. And he was convinced by ICE that turning over um, a custody to his, his sister would get his son released more quickly. Mm-hmm. The paperwork for that took about four months. Meanwhile, his... I can't remember how old his son was. I think he was, she was, he was four or five, again, really young, was four months alone without any family, complete strangers in a facility in Chicago where it is a rule that the people who work in those facilities are not allowed to, unless they need to change a diaper or whatnot, touch the children. So four months of a child broken from his, his family's home and his family's contact and anyone he ever knew, not even being touched by another human being. 
what what is going to become of this child? Eventually, he did transfer custody to his sister. The child was released, but now his his son is in New Jersey. He's in Honduras, has no legal means to ever see his son again. I mean, maybe they could fly back with the son to Honduras at some point, but he left because he was scared. You know, just like the the the, the incredible trauma that we don't understand that we're causing this these people that they're going to grow up and they're going to, how are they going to live this down yeah it, it's 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 shocking and sorry i know i took a sort of a long detour no, from the good. policy aspects but i think it's just really important to 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 hit home on on how incredibly painful and traumatizing these instances this this policy is i mean there's you know what you're describing there with us um those two cases i mean that is um I'm sure that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of those stories. There are, you know, and that's the that's the overwhelming thing. This isn't just a fluke or an anomaly or some glitch in the system. This is this is the system. This is how it's meant yes. to work. Yes. This is this is a this was a policy, an intentional policy. Yeah. And 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 it was carried out. Yeah. And, and you know, and and now right now the Trump administration is suing to try to to basically try to do it again. Um, you know, right now again the pandemic has sort of thrown everything in a little bit of chaos, but really the Trump administration has also uh, you know, welcomed in some regard the pandemic to drive home these policies that they had been aching to really implement for their, you know, f- since they came into office. But one of the other cases there still are uh, a number of families detained in the United States, and there's a couple fam- so-called family detention centers, which are really just mothers and young children, because um, the fathers are never allowed to uh, be detained with them. Um, they there's a 30-day court-mandated limit of how long a family, a so-called family, a mother and a young child, can be um, detained for. It's 30 days. It's called as part of the a Flores settlement agreement, and the Trump administration now, well, besides um, not abiding by that uh, 30-day limit, is trying to implement a what is called a binary choice, where the parents can either agree to be deported with their children, or they can stay on and fight their case, but their children will will not be kept in detention anymore. So their children will be taken out and put in the custody custody again of Health and Human Services, but the mothers will stay in detention. Mm-hmm. And there, it's this, just you know, if you are acknowledging that these people may have an asylum case to to make and claim and maybe granted it because they fear persecution and death or torture in their home countries, but you're making them do it while they're potentially being separated from their children. Again, that is well thought out, well argued, written down, you know, like poured over by government attorneys policy that is intentionally forcing parents to either give up on their asylum claims, face death or persecution at home, or be removed from their children. So I I feel like this question is stupid, but I'm going to ask it. Has this, have these policies enacted by the Trump administration in particular, has it done anything to deter people from trying to enter the United States as asylees? Yes and no. There are people who have gone through it. At this point, Arnovis, who tried three times, who went through this with his daughter, whose daughter is still living down and probably will be the rest of her life, this trauma, he right now is, he, he's not, he, he and his family are not doing well, but he is right now is facing the possibility of, you know, uh, of, that, of that persecution, that death that he fled because he's not willing he's willing to potentially sacrifice himself because he's not willing to take his daughter with him again nor is he willing to be separated from her so there's some cases like that of people who have gone through it where i think it has worked as a deterrent and there are other cases where there is you know misinformation or lack of information about the reality of of the cruelty that you know detention um, entails or the difficulty of crossing the border at this point where people are still leaving their homes and heading north to the United States, you know, from Central America, Mexico, the pandemic has changed that. And, you know, we saw and we've seen so many different efforts at cracking down, you know, beginning really in the 1990s, but it it went back uh, before that as well, 
where they tried to turn the border into a deathscape. And they did. And they, they intentionally forced people to walk across the desert to, you know, wade across the, you know, a, a, a river that claims, has claimed thousands of lives. They, they did that knowing or hoping that it would deter people. And it didn't. They, you know, the Obama administration expanded family detention to deter people, and it didn't. And even if you look at before the pandemic, child separation, you know, was enacted in starting, you know, February, March of 2018 and expanding in the, the subsequent months. That fall, you saw a huge increase in number of border crossings, even families with children. And so that didn't deter people either. Right now, I think people are staying at home for different reasons. But, you know, and so in individual cases, I would say, yes, it has worked as a deterrent. And sometimes there is a chilling effect that, you know, the Trump administration and other administrations have celebrated, that there's been a slight downturn for a couple of months. But in the end, the reality of these people's homes or people's lack of homes or people's inability to find and make a home and, and feel safe in their home forces people to leave their homes. That's just, that's human nature. So no, I, I don't think in the end it's going to have a deterrent effect. I don't think deterrence works. I think, I think enacting policies that undo the incredible harms that we've been waging against these countries for centuries at some, in some cases is the only way to keep people at home or to provide a home for people. There was, you know, I think of this quote, which I mentioned in the book a lot from Hannah Arendt. And she said that was what was unprecedented in the 20th century was not that people were leaving their homes but that people were unable to find a new home. That a little bit of a paraphrase there. People have always fled their homes. People throughout history, you know, seasonal changes, uh, you know, internal or you know international conflicts. There's always been something to drive people out of their homes, and it's not always violence. Sometimes it's migration for other reasons. And yet, what is new? And and really, we saw a change and a, a huge increase in this in the 20th century, which has been called the century of the refugee. I think that was, you know, a, a little bit uh, early. I think 21st century really mm. will be the century of the refugee. But what we saw that starting then was a huge concerted crackdown and, and a refusal to let people resettle and find new homes, even as we implemented these resettlement regimes. Right. Or, or settlement programs, sorry.